So the tribalism, I think, is a measure or is a reflection of the fact that the industry is still relatively early, right? And I think as the industry mature, I hope this tribalism will be reduced to just say, you know, we're here to build things that are useful for people. Who cares whether it's Ethereum or Solana or Bitcoin? It's just, if it's useful, it's useful. Bitcoin has its own characteristics. Ethereum has its own characteristics. There's absolutely no reason why they cannot coexist. I think those two are very different technology. Each have their own advantages and disadvantages. They're kind of complementary to each other. And we should try to build things that can combine the best of both worlds. You are listening to Beacon Podcast, Web3 Unlocked, a series where we sit down with the most successful founders in Web3 to explore their startup journeys. In this episode, we speak to David Say, professor of engineering at Stanford University and co-founder of Babylon Chain, a blockchain project that is scaling Bitcoin to secure the decentralized world. Listen to David's Web3 founder journey with hosts Kenzie Wang and Sachi Kamaya. I am Deeksha and you are listening to Beacon Podcast Series Web3 Unlocked. Enjoy the conversation. Before we dive in into all, um, you know, all your amazing stories about your Web3 founder journey, why don't you tell us that what's your most favorite thing about working in the Web3 space? Yeah, so the, my favorite thing of working in Web3 space is... I get to work with amazing people. So in my career, the most valuable thing I find, whatever I do, whether I'm a professor, whether I work with students, is the people I work with, is the quality of the people I work with. And in this Web3 space, I find the quality really amazing in terms of both technology, both in terms of the business vision, I've interacted with so many people in the past two years since I founded Babylon. It's really amazing. And how did you uh, jump into um, being a uh, you know a operator of a you know company in the Web three uh, space from academia? We uh, we love to learn that. You know, it's so exciting to to, uh, to see you here today. Yeah. So my background before I started Babylon was. Uh, um, uh, I was running a research group at Stanford on blockchain consensus protocol. So that's my, uh, I when I got, I started in the Web3 space doing research uh, five years ago. And doing research uh, is great because I get to explore the unknowns and I get to collaborate with very good people. For example, we had a very fruitful collaboration with Vitalik and his team on the Ethereum proof of stake protocol. But, you know, collaboration, working with people, giving people advice, improving other people's protocol is other people's vision. You're helping other people's vision. But after working so, with so many collaboration, we also collaborate with Cardano team. We figure out, I figure out that, hey, you know what? I really want to have my own vision and build something towards that vision as opposed to just at the service of other people's vision. So that's sort of, why the stimulus of starting a project. And so Babylon was the sort of the output of a lot of brainstorming on what that vision would be. And how's it going so far? You know, I, I know that you guys have been uh, making uh, lots of waves in the industry uh, recently, also given that, uh, you know, there's a ton of hype now about Bitcoin. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about uh, Babylon's journey uh, what inspired you to start Bar Babylon? And also, uh, you know, tell us a little bit more about the project overall. The general, the broad idea, the vision of Babylon is to leverage off the security of the most secure blockchain in Web3, which is Bitcoin, and leverage off for the benefit of not just Bitcoin, the currency, but for the entire crypto ecosystem. That is the vision the broad vision that we started off the project. Now, how to do that, uh, of course, is the question. And in fact, we have to go back to Nakamoto himself. He actually also had something like this because his view of Bitcoin is that it should be kept very simple and anything else that you want to build for specific applications, other applications, should be built as simple as a side chain that gets security from Bitcoin. So he started off uh, this concept called ColorCoin in 2011, which embodied this concept of 
having a side chain sharing the secured Bitcoin. However, his way of sharing is sharing the work, the work, right? Because Bitcoin is secured by proof of work and he has a way called merge mining that allows him to share this, the work to other chains. Now, however, nowadays, the, all the rage, the new chains are essentially all proof of stake chains, not proof of work chain. And so we have to innovate because Nakamoto's method does not work anymore. Because Nakamoto basically shared the work and therefore all, all the chains that share the security are proof of work chain. And so we figure a way to actually share the secure Bitcoin, but not through the work that is the input to proof of Bitcoin, but to use the Bitcoin asset as the staking asset to secure other chains. So that's some of the main innovation. And it took us a while to come here because, you know, whenever you think about Bitcoin, you think about security, you think about proof of work, you never thought that it would have any connection to proof of stake. And so kind of the oxymoron, the paradoxical invention here is that proof of stake chain was invented to sort of replace Bitcoin, to replace proof of work. But proof of work, Bitcoin is still sitting around, still occupying 50% or more of the Web3 crypto asset. And so we find out a, it, actually a very interesting new use case for Bitcoin is in fact as a staking asset for proof of stake chain. So we're using proof of stake chain to create a new use case for Bitcoin. So I don't know if the founders, the inventors of proof of stake chain would like this idea because it's kind of like, okay, we actually cannot replace Bitcoin. In fact, we can, we're helping Bitcoin. That's a true innovation. Uh, we're all super excited about, you know, what this uh, means for the space in general. Um, would love to know a little bit about your early days at uh, uh, Babylon. So how did you come up with a name and, you know, how did you... Uh, you know, recruit your founding team members. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Babylon is a very ancient city, very ancient city. And um, in fact, it is known to be also one of the earliest or if not the first sort of city which has a marketplace. So it's like the first marketplace in the world. And what we're creating here in Babylon, the project is essentially to create a marketplace for security. So Bitcoin holders can bring the Bitcoin to provide security into this marketplace and proof of stake chains or in general proof of stake systems can come to this marketplace to demand security. So therefore, Babylon is the marketplace for security. So that's the na where the name came from. Uh, in terms of recruiting our team, uh, our team initially has been entirely a R&D team only researchers and protocol engineers. So it's a bunch of very geeky people. Uh, and the team is basically uh, my co-founder, uh, Fisher. He is um, our CTO. And um, I knew him from many years ago doing research in blockchain. And uh, so we recruited a bunch of very good protocol engineers through our own network of collaborators, uh, and so forth. And that's uh, one of the advantages of starting with a very strong researchers network. So we have a very strong researcher network because of all these collaboration we've done before with other projects. And so it was, it took us a relatively short time to build the core engineering team together. And so I guess uh, um, you all met at Stanford, right? So at uh, Stanford, that's where the team got together. And then uh, one day you decided that, you know, you have enough, uh, you know, this momentum in, uh, in building the project, right? So is that, is that how it came together? Yeah, so the, the actually, no. Actually, the team is very decentralized around the world. Just like blockchain, it, our team is very decentralized. So uh our team has a special characteristic because most of the engineers have a lot of experience in building layer one protocols, so consensus protocols. That is kind of a very specialized knowledge. It's not like smart contract. Many people program solidity. So that kind of expertise is very broad. A layer one consensus protocol design and engineering is a very relatively niche 
protocol. So we have to basically search around the world to find these people, and we have to go to where these people are. We cannot demand all of them to come to Stanford uh, to form this team. So our team at the very beginning is very decentralized. We have a bunch of people in Europe. We have a bunch of people in Australia, a few people in the Bay Area. And uh, yeah, so that's the team. That's incredible. Um, kudos to that on building teams. We also love to know a little bit more about, you know, as, you know, uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, a security marketplace, like you said, what defensibilities have you built into your uh, marketplace to uh, defend against other new entrants down the line? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, right, blockchain is an open source software, basically, right? That's the, that's the ethos of the uh, ecosystem. So, you know, in general, anybody can copy anybody, anybody's code and build something. However, uh, our technology is pretty sophisticated because Bitcoin, unlike a smart contract platform, Okay, so if you want to copy, say, uh, um, a Ethereum smart contract uh, dApps, okay, then you just have to reprogram the smart contract, all right? Change a few things, maybe. But for us, our protocol is actually a combination of how to smartly program in the Bitcoin script, the Bitcoin language, which is already a very limited expertise, Combine this with some advanced cryptography and combine it with proof of stake necessary, proof of stake protocol design. So we're combining three or four different elements. And I must say it's very hard to create a, te an, an, a competing team to have all these expertise to build all these things. And uh, yeah, I think that is our main technological uh, defensibility. And uh, from a business point of view, our hope is that once we attract a critical mass of chains using this marketplace, then we could create some network effect across these chains as well. Because they're sharing the same marketplace, we have some shared data and we can leverage of the shared data to provide even more services. And that would be another way of defending. Yeah, I, these type of marketplace business is typically a, a winner take all. And given that you have a, a first mover advantage and also a lot of a, a, a brand equity uh, for the company that you build and also the, uh, investors that you attracted, I think that also would build a lot of trust uh, with getting uh, initial liquidity into your, your protocol. Uh, so I can definitely see that. How has your uh, experience as a a uh, founder now, differing from uh, an esteemed professor, uh, you know, how is this different from your past uh, roles and also endeavors? As a researcher in the university, the main output of a project is typically a research paper in a top conference. Like, for example, in security, there's this, these two or three very top conferences. And your goal is to publish there. But once you publish there, you're done. You move on to another paper, another project. So it's a relatively short term. Now, you may work in blockchain, the general space, but the project-wise is a very short-term focus. Whereas doing a startup is a totally different time scale. And particularly in the kind of fundamental startup that we are building right now, which is Babylon, it's kind of really quite, um, I would say, different, right, from what other people have been doing is a very long-term thing, right? First of all, you have this idea which sounds really wacky, right? Using Bitcoin, a proof-of-work network to secure proof-of-stake chains, like it's totally weird. So it took a long, long time to sort of get people sort of come to grips, come to terms with this idea. And then you have to build the marketplace, you have to attract people to join the marketplace, you have to attract two sides, the Bitcoin holders, and the proof of stake systems to join the marketplace. So it's a very long journey. So that's one thing I find. It's like running a marathon as compared to running sprints. And I think that's in my mind is the biggest contracts, contrast. Just to uh, double click on this topic here, also would love to get your insight into some unique qualities of uh, 
being a Web3 founder versus, let's say, a Web2 founder? Yeah. So uh, I've never been a Web2 founder. So it's a little bit hard for me to make the comparison. However, I have web worked in the Web2 space as a, so in my previous research career, my focus was in wireless communication. I was part of this journey of going from zero cell phones to, you know, six or seven billion cell phones. I developed some of the core technology that actually everybody uses in the cell phones. I have some experience there. And so I would say that in my mind, uh, the usual typical exit of a startup in that era is basically acquisition by a big company. Acquisition by a big company, like, you know, the Qualcomm or some, or, um, or Samsung or something like that. Whereas in Web3, that is not the typical exit of a project. Yes. There are no big companies like Google is unlikely going to buy out Babylon, right? It'll be very surprising if I say, you know, hey, Google is making us an offer to buy, <laughs> to buy Babylon. That doesn't, that's probably not going to happen. So it's a, it's a very different uh, economics, I think. Totally. And that's the exciting part. Uh, I'm that's sure exciting. you know. Next couple of years will be uh, uh, a, a very fun ride. Next question for you, David, is uh, what are, you know, some lessons that you did not anticipate so far, you know, uh, being, you know, a, uh, you know, in, in, on this new journey, right, in Web3, uh, any, any lessons or challenges you can share with us? I think what I'm going to share is quite personal, quite personal, but I think, you know, this is about founders, different types of founders. Everyone has a different experience. For, my, for me, I have a lot of experience in running teams, but the teams is typically research teams, right? So I have, you know, my group have students, have researchers, and we, I would form teams and get them set on a, a goal, right? A research project. The difference between that type of team and the team that I'm building right now at Babylon is that that kind of team is very homogenous. They're basically all researchers. Whereas in a startup like Babylon, the team has been much more diverse. We started off, as I mentioned, with protocol engineers and researchers, but then very quickly we find out that, hey, there's, there's not enough to build a product. We need to bring in different people. We need to bring in product strategy people. We need to bring in product people. We need to bring in marketing people. We need to bring in business development people. We need to bring in ecosystem people. So all kinds of people. So it's a huge challenge actually to run this team because different types of people have a very different thinking, a very different culture. And to get them together and align them in to, to achieve a single goal, in my, for me personally, is a huge challenge. And I'm learning every day on how to do this better and better. Oh yeah, totally. And then there's also this, you know, push and pull between Web 2, the tech side, and also the Web 3, you know, the you know, the, uh, the community side. So yeah, there's, uh, uh, lots of, you know, there's, that's the fun part about, uh, being a web three founder. My final question here for you is, uh, um, uh, has there been any setbacks or challenges and, you know, in the, uh, Babylon journey so far and how did you overcome, uh, such setbacks? Yeah. So, uh, we just finished a fundraising round, as you know, thank you very much for your support. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this journey. Yeah. A personal note. Uh, uh, but you know, honestly, when we started the fundraise, it was not easy going, just to be honest about it. The market was bad. Everyone was skeptical and we're pushing a pretty new idea, right? As I mentioned, using Bitcoin to secure proof of stake chain. And at that time, when we started this fundraise, Bitcoin was not very hot either. Now it's much more, much more people are interested in Bitcoin, but at that time, July, August time frame. So it was pretty tough. I have to be honest. It was, had been really tough to try to make this pitch. But after a certain critical point, suddenly at some point, people kind of got that idea. And then it became like, when people got that idea, people would say, hey, hey, man, this idea is so simple. I should have invented this idea. And then at that point, we know that the pitch was sort of finally got through, finally got through. 
Because if you think about it, on hindsight, right, you think back at it, but, but if you're looking for a asset, a crypto asset to secure a blockchain, why not look at the largest and the most idle asset, which is Bitcoin, to serve that function? On hindsight, it seems like such a natural concept, but it took many months for us to convince people to look, to look at the public at different angles figure out how, why people are confused or they're not, they're skeptical in, before we get that message through. That, that was a pretty tough process. Well, they say uh, fundraising uh, uh, is, is difficult until it becomes easy. So, yes. Oh, wow. Easy. Okay. Please. Yes. So, um, how has Babylon Chain engaged with its community and what role has the community played in the project's development? So the first com community that Babylon engaged and leveraged off of is the Cosmos community. So that was the beginning point of our project. So a lot of our community comes from our engagement with, yeah. as you know, Cosmos is kind of a single uh, community, a broader community, but there are many sub-communities belonging to different Cosmos app chains. And so our first engagement is to build a relationship with all these communities and draw our own community from these communities. So I would think that that is kind of our uh, sort of initial engagement. So uh, uh, more recently, we have been trying to reach out to other communities as well. So for example, you know, talking to uh, Sandeep, um, the Polygon community, uh, Abitrum community, and uh, so forth. So, yeah. And um, so one thing is that our technology is pretty, our, our project is pretty technical. So the challenge for us to, is to really explain sort of our technology in the simplest way so that we can get a broad community. I guess some... Um... Yeah, going off of that, like how have you worked with, um, in addition to Cosmos, like how have you worked with Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, et cetera, in terms of co collaborating uh, and integrating with Babylon Chain? Um, yeah, could you mention some of the partnerships and milestones that you guys have achieved so far? Yeah, so this is still in the relatively early phase. So Bitcoin staking, so although we have worked on this project for uh, the Bit Babylon project for almost two years now, Bitcoin staking is the most recent protocol that we came up with. So we launched this protocol back in the July timeframe. So it's only been a few months. Uh, so right now, the, the, uh, the discussion beyond Cosmos is mainly with the founders, like with Sandeep, et cetera. So yeah, so that's the level that we have. With uh, Abitrum, we've been talked to at, at, at Fountain. So it's mainly with the founders. Got it, got it. Um, and are there specific projects or initiatives in the Web3 space that you find particularly inspiring or impactful? Yeah, so I could tell you two projects that was quite inspiring to us. Uh, one is Celestia. So Celestia is a very quite inspiring project. I know the founding team very early on. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the research topics that we do is data availability. Uh, in our research and uh, data availability is also part of our roadmap in Babylon. And uh, so we got a lot of inspiration from uh, uh, Mustafa, Mustafa Al-Bassam and his team. Uh, and uh, the concept of modularity, uh, which is a, you know, a very broad concept, of course, but uh, I think they have done a good job of highlighting that as a part of a very important part of the design of blockchain protocol. Uh, has a lot of influence on us because our protocol, our Babylon protocol, is also very modular. It is designed to be used as a plugin on top of almost all existing proof of stake protocol. So it is a very much following a modularity concept. Uh, the second project, which is quite inspiring to us as well, is Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer was founded by uh, Shram Kanan. Shram Kanan, I knew him for about 15 years already. In fact, our first, my first paper in blockchain research is a collaboration with Shram. 
And there was also Schrems first paper in blockchain. So in fact, we started exploring the blockchain as a research space together. And so I know him for many years and he's an advisor in a project. And uh, we are very grateful to Eigenlayer for doing a lot of work in uh, explaining this concept of shared security, shared security, and making it, popularizing it in the community. And it was certainly very helpful to Babylon. Uh, because in addition to this in kind of intuitive concept of using Bitcoin as a staking asset, it is sort of in conjunction also with this broader concept of shared security. And so if we had to explain bear Babylon from ground zero, it will be even more tough than our experience had been. So, uh, uh, so we are grateful for the innovative work that the EigenLayer team has done in this area as well. I guess, how would you measure um, success for, for Babylon Chain, like both personally and in terms of the broadly, you know, the project's contribution to the Web3 community? I think uh, a successful Babylon will be a day whenever someone wants to launch a new proof of stake system, proof of stake chain or an AVS so called, um, then they would always include Bitcoin as at least one of the sticking asset. It's like, you know, everybody wants to, whenever they want to create an investment portfolio, they were thinking of including a bond, bond as part of the portfolio. And Bitcoin as the sticking asset would play that role as a stable, as a relatively stable asset that would provide a bedrock of security for almost all proof of stake projects. So that would be, I think if we get to that day, I would consider Babylon as a great success. Got it, got it. And I guess like what advice would you give for any, you know, as aspiring engineers or entrepreneurs or, or even researchers that are looking to enter the Web3 space? So uh, these are engineers that are from the Web2 world or what's the context here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Web2, Web3 web compared to Web2, one of the biggest difference from the point of view of uh, development is the open source nature, is the collaborative nature. I think that is sort of an ethos that it's very important to understand. Yeah. I would think that's the biggest distinction that I can think of. And I guess what about for, um, you know, folks that are currently pursuing a PhD? and are looking to start like a Web3 company? Like, do you have any specific advice for them? So I have to tell you that most people who do PhDs are not interested in doing startups. I can tell you from experience because at Stanford, yeah. most students who are interested in doing a startup in crypto are undergraduates. They're yeah, not PhDs. That's students. fair. There are some very rare exceptions. Like Espresso System, for example, is started by two um, students of Professor Dan Bonnet, two PhD students. But other than the rare exception, most of the startup is from undergraduates. PhD students tend to be rather conservative in general. Doing a startup in Web3 is really quite, uh, as I mentioned, right? Because there are no acquisition paths, hardly any acquisition path for startup. So it's like you have to go all the way to IPO. Yeah. Right, that's the analogy I was thinking for Web2. It's like, if you think about Web2, it's like, hey, you know, you start a company, your only exit is IPO. Either failure or IPO. I don't right, think right, many right. people would start companies, right? You've done with it, okay? Because a lot of people start companies for acquisition. I mean, they want to be acquired by Google, Facebook, right? Or something like that from Facebook. So that's I think- That's fair, that's fair. Uh, yeah, so undergraduates, on the other hand, are very interested in the crypto space. We got- for example, when I teach undergraduate, uh, when I teach a graduate class in blockchain, most of the students are undergraduates. So they're really into, and I think the excitement there in my mind is that a lot of PhD students are missing the story because there are, uh, crypto is one place where research ideas can be converted into building real systems in a very short time. Like think about zero knowledge, right? ZK. Uh, just a few years ago, people would tell you this is like completely academic subject, zero application. When when, when Professor Michalis, 
Professor Sylvia McCulley, MIT professor, who invented the concept of zero knowledge. Okay. It's like it, it, his paper got rejected like multiple times, five times or something like that. People didn't really think about this idea as anything. But then now everybody is like talking about ZK, right? Everyone is talking about ZK. Yeah. And uh, that's the excitement of being able to convert a complete academic idea into reality in a short few years. Yeah, and, and congratulations on the recent, you know, fundraise. Yeah, could you give us an overview of like how how you guys are planning to use uh uh the the funds that you guys raised, which I believe is about eighteen million, um, to advance the Bab- Babylon pro- Protocol? Yeah, first of all, we have to increase, we have to expand our team. Our team is still relatively small, 15, 16 people. Uh, to be able to do what we want to do, we need a bigger team. We need to hire more engineers. We need to hire more um, uh, ecosystem. Hey, can I do an av- advertisement here? I re- we're really looking for a chief, uh, chief growth officer. Okay. Anyone listen to this podcast? If they're interested, please DM me somewhere. I assume you leave my contact at the end of the or a part of this podcast. So yeah, um, that's one thing. Two is that we want to um, build this Babylon ecosystem, this marketplace where there are lots of projects, proof of stake projects, projects that built on Babylon, and yeah, we want to get this thing started. And I would think that we would like to allocate some of this resource to so providing grants to encourage projects to build on top of Babylon. So that is sort of another way we want to use this this uh, funding. Yeah. So those are the two ways we can think of right now. And of course, there are other more mundane stuff like we need to hire uh, lawyers to set up foundations and token launch, etc. But that is uh, kind of boring. So I won't mention that. But that will. That's the fun thing. You always have to pay lawyers. No matter what you do, you have to pay the lawyers. Yeah, <laughs> always. I mean, <laughs> always. Yeah, when when you raise, you know, funding from some of the top VCs in the space, including you know, Symbolic Capital, Hack VC, Polychain, et cetera. I guess, like, what were your takeaways or like interactions like with, um, uh, you know, speaking to to these top VCs, uh, when when you were pitching them. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the beginning phase was rather difficult. We are explaining a basically a sort of a zero to one type idea to these folks, and it was um, uh, rather hard going. But uh, after a certain point, as, as Kenzie said, what, what do you say? You said it, in, in, fundraising is hard until it's easy. Uh, yeah. At some point, it, it clicked, and uh, so I think. Sort of the hard thing is as in any fundraise is to get the lead, to get the lead. Because the lead is the one who is basically sticking the neck out, right? right. Sticking the neck out. Because, hey, this is a complete new concept. I don't know if this is going to work. You know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin sticking, what's that? So they're sticking the neck out. And we're very fortunate to have these two leads, uh, Hack VC. And um, and the party chain to believe in us, and we are also very fortunate to have multiple very important strategic partners, including Symbolic Capital and Polygon Ventures, as well as uh, OKX and also um, Bitcoin centric funds to yeah to support our effort and. As I said, Babylon is a very broad project. It really requires a lot of partners from many different aspects of Web3 to work with us. So we've been, for me, fundraising is capital. Capital is, of course, very important. Without capital, you can't do things. But uh, equally important is to find the right set of partners to help us along in this journey. So we've been very fortunate to get the set of partners. It was not easy work, but I think it was at the end a good result. Yeah, commendable. And as we say, we can only win together in Web3. You know, it's like you cannot have one winner. So really curious, you know, to ask you that what are your thoughts on the Ethereum ecosystem uh, generally? 
And what do you think about Bit- Bitcoin ecosystem and Ethereum ecosystem coexisting? Because, you know, we see a lot of tribalism in the crypto community as such. And how you as a founder building this project look at this? Yeah, so the tribalism, I think, is a measure or is a reflection of the fact that our base is still relatively early. The industry is still relatively early, right? So people get very attached to something which is not necessarily, you know, utilitarian. So I, I think that's early. And I think as the industry mature, I hope this tribalism will be reduced to just say, you know, we're here to build things that are useful for people. Who cares whether it's Ethereum or Solana or Bitcoin? It's just, if it's useful, it's useful. So what my, my point is that Bitcoin has its own characteristics. Ethereum has its own characteristics. There's absolutely no reason why they cannot coexist. Why it has to be that Ethereum will take over and there's no more Bitcoin or vice versa. Uh, I, I don't really believe in that. I think those two are very different technology. Each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Ethereum is a universal computing platform. Uh, it's very versatile, but at the same time, because of that, it may have some security limitation. Bitcoin is very simple. Uh, the security problem is very strong. Its vers- vers- versatility is limited. And uh, so they're kind of complementary to each other. And we should try to build things that can combine the best of both worlds. So there's no, in my mind, there's no, I don't think, I don't envision that it will be like one of the two chains or one, one chain takes all, when it takes all. I don't, I don't think it will happen. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Vitalik has been predicting what do you call this thing? Um, there's this concept called flipping. Flipping, that's right. Flipping. Well, flipping hasn't happened yet, so. Yes, that's true. And, um, well, now we have some fun questions for you. Um, it's like a kind oh, of wow. here, but since we have, like, I think um, close to 10 minutes, you can take maybe a little longer to in any answer if you feel like. So I'm going to start. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, David, what is a book? What is that one book that you feel sort of changed, you know, uh, your perspective into about something important in life or left a huge impact? And what impact did it leave on you? I'm asking so we can also read this book. We are making like a book recommendations uh, blog also. So this book... It changed my life because it is an invention of a concept called information theory. Uh, so information theory was invented by a person called Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon. He wrote this long paper, which afterwards converted into a book in 1948, which is to mathematically quantify what information is. And to me, when I read this book, I was like completely blown away. How can you have a mathematical way of quantifying such a broad and abstract concept of information? And uh, not only he succeeded in writing a beautiful paper, a beautiful book, but that beautiful book also changed the world. Without that book, today, I would not be talking to you right now, I don't think, over Zoom, because that book, the invention of that book becomes the core building block of all communication technology, whether it's cell phone or over the Wi-Fi or over the internet, et cetera. So yeah, so that book I think is a, I think is underappreciated by the world, but definitely my recommended reading. Wow, thank A mathematical that- theory of communication or information theory, yeah. yeah. By Claude definitely- Shelley. Add it in the recom- in the show notes. Okay, now this one you might have a tough time. Uh, what do you enjoy more and why? Being a professor or being a Web3 founder? I would say those two jobs are totally different and therefore cannot be compared. This sounds like a, a slack off answer, but a professor's job mainly 
is education, I think. So I do research, but in my mind, research is a means to educate students. Research is not really the final output. So the main product in the, for a professor is to, uh, education, educating students. The main product of a startup is a product that hopefully a lot of people will use. So I think those two are very different uh, types of jobs. Uh, and um, yeah, I kind of like both, actually. And I think that's the great thing about being a professor is that uh, I can actually do both. I can take time off from my professor job and spend time, a few years of my life doing this uh, amazing project, working with amazing people. Okay. We will be lenient with you since you didn't pick one, but yeah, it's a fair answer. <laughs> 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 And it's, it's a trap. I know it's a yes. trap. I'm not going to fall into that trap. <laughs> Kenzie, what is his favorite portfolio company? You know, he'll never give an answer to something like that. Okay. So, it's like asking me, what's my, who's my favorite son, right? It's the same kind of question. Yeah, but that's my job. I need to ask that right in this round. Okay. So how many times have you read the Bitcoin white paper? And what is the one thing about that paper that blew your mind? I'm sure something did. Yes, I read it multiple times. Indeed, I read it multiple times. And uh, every time I need new ideas, I would read it again. Uh, because one thing that blows my mind away is in some sense, a lot of the key infrastructure technology that we have been building stems from that paper. Stems from that paper. Uh, whether is, uh, uh, so that paper is very short, right? It's like eight page long. Many white papers are much longer than that. But the amount of ideas it contains, think about it, just to give example, right? People think of uh, the key ideas in that paper would be like proof of work, uh, one key idea. They would involve uh, double spending, protecting against double spending attack. That's another idea. But actually, there are many ideas. For example, we talked a lot about, in the past few years, scaling, right? scalability, how to scale blockchains. Well, that idea was already in the white paper, believe it or not. In fact, it was not an idea. It was actually something that he built. It's called light client. So this concept of light client is to allow many nodes with very low computational power to participate in the blockchain. So think about it, right? The guy just came with this idea of Bitcoin. Is it the first ever such system? Scaling the system seems like a very, very far away idea when you're just building the first system, right? You may have just a few nodes. Why do you even think about scaling? And he already had this idea as one section in this light paper. And uh, so that was the amazing thing about how far-sighted, how far-sighted this inventor is, was. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I never noticed it's actually one of the shortest ones. It's around eight, nine pages. Uh, going to revisit it. What is that one hobby that you would spend more time doing outside work if you had more time? Non-crypto, blockchain related. The one hobby that I would spend more time doing is teaching math to my daughter. Yes. If I had more time, I would spend more time doing that. Because actually, I think that task is maybe even more difficult than building Babylon. Because my daughter re thinks I don't know much, always reject my try attempt to educate her, her. And so if I had more time, I would spend more time doing, trying to do that. I should say trying to do that. Yes. That's a very sweet answer. Uh, what is that one technology you wish you had invented and why? I mean, you can wish many things, but I guess the natural thing is that I wish I had invented Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. 
<laughs> in yeah. this context, in this context, I guess I don't need to explain why, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't need to. Okay. So now that we are talking about flashback, uh, what is your advice to younger David? Let's say in your, if you had to advise you in your, advise yourself into your thirties, like what would your advice be if you could go back and give some advice? Wow. Your questions are not easy. This is a very interesting question. I'm trying to remember what was, what was the state of mind I was in in, in the thirties. First of all, (laughs) yeah, I, okay. So my advice for David at that age would be to spend more energy at that time trying to think of good startup ideas as opposed to write more academic papers because actually in my earlier life I was rather academic uh, and I would focus a lot of my energy on writing papers. I would say to David at age 30, say, hey, you know what? You should do startup when you are younger, not when you are older. It's a terrible idea to do a startup when you're older because it takes a huge amount of energy to do a startup because it is a marathon. It's a very long journey. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, your story is so inspiring, David. We had so much fun talking to you. And I think we are are done with questions with that. And I wish you a great 2024. And thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Sachi. Thank you, Kenzie, for joining during holidays. And um, everybody listening, thanks for listening. Keep listening to Beacon Podcast, Web3 Unlocked series. We'll be back next time with another Web3 founder journey. 